Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my podcasts and uh, YouTube videos on GaudiumItSpez22.com. I am uh, Dr. Larry Chapp, and I am pleased, so very pleased to be joined today by someone I don't think I've ever met in person. Ken, we've never met in person, have we? I don't no. believe we have. No. We've just interacted on social media and so on. We have a lot of mutual friends. Dr. Kenneth Craycraft. And uh, Dr. Craycraft uh, teaches at Mount St. Mary Seminary and School of Theology, which is in Cincinnati, uh, not the Mount St. Mary Seminary I attended in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Uh, he's also you're also a lawyer, right? I am. Yes, I, I'm a lawyer and I still have a small law practice. Uh, but, yeah, I've been practicing law since uh, 2001 uh, uh, and, and, and teaching now at the seminary full-time for five years after being an mm. adjunct for several years. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. If I need to sue somebody, I'll call you <laughs> up. Anyway, he got his law degree at the uh, Duke university school of law, PhD in theology, uh, from Boston college and MA from the university of Cincinnati an MA and an and div from Cincinnati Christian university and a BA from Malone university. Uh, he is the James J Gardner family chair of moral theology at Mount St. Mary's Seminary and School of Theology. Uh, and uh, the reason why I mean, actually I was introduced to your thought years and years and years ago. That's how old you and I are. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know what year it was, maybe 1999, your book, uh, The Probably. Myth, The American Myth of Religious Freedom. I read that book and I immediately became a Ken Craycraft fan after reading that book. And then George Weigel came and spoke at DeSales University, where I was. He didn't like I, he didn't like my book. He didn't like the book. And I because I said, George, what did you I just finished reading this great book by this guy I've never heard of before, Ken Craycraft. He goes, I know, Ken, I think Ken regrets some of what he wrote in that book and so on. Uh, no, I don't think you do, actually. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. What I what I regret, Larry, is some of the, uh, the positions that I had before I wrote the book that I backed away from, uh, not not anything that I've written. In there the you go. Yeah. But as I always like to say, you know, uh, George is a great guy. He's he's yeah. a he's a friend of mine, friend of yours, too, I'm assuming. Uh, and he's just a great guy. I love George. He so, is. And, uh, and I do, yeah. too. And we've we've had uh, we we don't we uh, you know, we don't we don't have as much contact as we used to. But, yeah, it's always it's always very cordial. And uh, I will probably see him when I'm in Rome in October to discuss uh, to covering the Synod on Synod, uh, the big meeting on meetings, as I like to call it anyway. But we are here today to discuss your latest book, which I reviewed. And people yes. can go to my blog or they can go to Catholic World Report and they can see my review of Ken Craycraft's latest book. Uh, citizens, there it is. I always have trouble centering these things. Citizens yet strangers living authentically Catholic in a divided America. What's great about this book, and I, I sort of I wish I'd have pointed this out in my review as well, but words are at a premium in a review and something like Catholic World Report, is that it's both a very profound text. It's an academic text. It, it makes serious scholarly points all throughout, but it's also written in a very accessible language, uh, nor is it a 500 page tome that's going to take you a year and a half to read. Uh, it, it's, it's only about, I think, about 190 pages or so. Uh, and so it's very accessible, very condensed, gets right to the point. And, and so I liked it. Uh, and, and the text is obviously about political theory and how Catholics are to negotiate the modern American political landscape. So first off, hey, thanks, Ken, for joining me today. Well, thanks, Larry. It's good to be here, and I'm I'm uh, happy that uh, that you like the book, and and thank you for supporting it. And it, it's uh, nice to be on here to chat with you about the book, and and I and thank you for those comments as well, because uh, that's very um, uh, that's very encouraging, uh, because that was our goal. I mean, obviously, it's written by it's published by Popular Press, uh, uh, our Sunday Visitor Press, not an academic press, and we wanted to uh, to straddle that line between an academic book. Uh, and an accessible book. Uh, we want it to be uh, accessible to the layperson who doesn't necessarily have a theological, uh, a formal theological background. So it's very encouraging that that's the way that the tone of the book struck you. And for the non-writers out there, I can only say, because it's what I strive to do as well in my blog and Catholic World Report and in my book, Confession of a Catholic Worker, uh, that just came out from Ignatius Press last year, it is extremely difficult to write in a manner that is both academic and scholarly, but yet in an 
in a language that is accessible to sort of average people. Uh, that's not an easy thing to pull off, but you've pulled it off quite well in this in this book. So that's the first thing I want to do. I want to recommend to all of my viewers and listeners, if you are at all interested in this subject of uh, politics and Catholicism, especially in an American context, then run, don't walk, go to click on Amazon or, or our Sunday visitors webpage and, and get yourself a copy of this book. Not expensive. It, it will not take you forever to read. And yet I, it is extremely helpful. And I'll just go through a little. It, it begins with a sort of critique of American politics and American culture. Then the middle part of the book deals with the Catholic social teaching as an answer to some of the problems you raise in the beginning. And then, of course, in the end, you're offering some suggestions about friendship and discipleship and so on. So let's get into it. In your own words, um, you know, why did you write this book? What motivated you to write the book? You know, I always like to ask authors that question first. What motivated me, uh, Larry, is that we, we live in a culture. Well, first of all, the animating print, the animating sort of voice behind the whole book is the first chapter of Alistair McIntyre's book after virtue which which I think is one of the, the the you know one of the 10 most important pages written about moral philosophy uh in in the last 40 or 50 years because uh, and if readers aren't familiar or listeners aren't familiar with it it's where he poses this very famous um my uh, thought experiment in which you know science science there's a, a series of natural disasters in which all which is blamed on scientists and science in general and so there's this mob ri rising up of a mob that destroys all the scientific textbooks burns the books lynches the uh the scientists burns down the buildings uh and then an, a, a new enlightened uh company comes along a new enlightened era and they try to put science back together but but there, there's no cohesive story about what science is because it's all been burned and scattered. And so they put pieces back together that they have no idea that they don't fit together, competing theories, contradictory theories. And what McIntyre suggests is that that's very much the state of moral the of philosophy in, in the real world. Uh, his his uh, anal analogous or his metaphorical um, example of of this with this thought experiment, and I, I think about that in terms of what we how we Catholics interact specifically with American political culture, because it seems to me and this and what really motivated the book was Catholics who firmly believe in the in the teaching of the church who desire to think with the church uh, mass going catholics who who you know we're not talking about dissenters we're talking about people who really desire to think with the church and 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 really understand the importance of that but yet who speak a language that in many ways is at tension with the historic understanding of the human person, of the nature of community, uh, of the nature of relationships and so forth, of the nature even of politics and the government. And, and not only do we speak that language and think that way, that that's in tension with, but in many ways, the language that we speak, even when we try to articulate our understanding of what it means to be Catholic, is a language that actually is contradictory to many things that are distinct about a Catholic understanding of the person, about God, about the universe, about society, about uh, 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 political and economic and social structures, and so, so I, I and I and I get frustrated when I when I when I inter interact with Catholics who are who are firm believers, very very good people, and yet who uh, hew to a, a moral language that actually is more informed by contemporary liberal politics than it is by. Uh, Catholic faith. And then what happens is we find ourselves frustrated when things like, for example, and I use this as the paradigmatic example, when things like abortion come up and we want to speak about abortion in terms that we want to, to defend human life, and yet we resort to a language that, that was invented in the 15th, 16th century precisely to supplant a Catholic understanding of the human person in order to try to articulate a Catholic understanding of the human person. And that's just one example. So what I wanted to do was to say, look, one of the problems we Catholics have in speaking to each other, much less speaking to a broader public, is that we are, as in the mcintyre fashion, we are trying to cobble together different types of language, linguistic communities and linguistic structures, and even terminologies and vocabularies that are not consistent with one another and that are certainly not consistent with the history of the of, of the church. 
And I thought, how do I simplify this in such a way that I can make the point and make it accessible? And so I thought, well, let's just take the four, what I call the four pillars of Catholic social doctrine. That's not original to me, uh, you know, uh, dignity, solidarity, subsidiarity, and the common good. Let's take those as a foundation for trying to recover a distinctly Catholic language after, which I do in the first couple of the introduction, the first chapter, kind of dismantle the language that we've been using and explain why I think that the language that we typically default to is a mistake and then try to build back up from that in the later chapters of the book in the chapters on family and work and economics and politics. Well, that's a great summary. That That's a great, great segue, a great way to start. I especially like, uh, the, and you mentioned in the book, the, the reference to Alistair McIntyre's great book, After Virtue. Uh, how many years ago, decades, was that written? 50? I, I believe it was published in 1984. So 40 years ago, 40 years I just, ago. Yeah, it, it seems as contemporary to me. I mean, I, 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 I voraciously read it as a young man. Uh, I was still in my 20s in 1984 when it came out. And those first pages, like you just, they really struck that whole thought experiment just yeah. really, really struck me. And of course, he ends the book famously with, you know, <laughs> we are w waiting for a new St. Benedict to show up to sort of put Humpty Dumpty back together right. again. And you know, and you know I, I didn't invoke that St. Benedict image uh, for reasons related to, you know, it's already been done. Uh, the book has already been written, or at least an attempt to write the book, uh, yeah. the Benedict option. But, but I do, in fact, take the notion of civic friendship from the book, from After Virtue, and try to adapt that to what I do in this book in the last chapter to try to suggest that even if we find at the end of the day, and I know I'm getting ahead a little bit, even if we find at the end of the day that being a patriotic American is difficult, if not in some sense almost impossible, that doesn't mean that we can't be good civic friends and we can't develop the virtues that are incumbent upon us to be good civic friends even in a political culture, which I think without any question in my mind is always at tension with being a Catholic, if it, if it is not, as some people uh, contend more radically even than I do, that American political culture is actually contradictory to and, and therefore not compatible with uh, being Catholic, we can still be good civic friends for the purposes of uh, fulfilling our duty to engage in public life and so forth, and and uh, and I and I think that that what McIntyre, when in, in later books, when McIntyre develops, you know, uh, themes of uh, of tradition laden rationality and attempts to try to uh, communicate with 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 people whose reason is informed by different traditions, that 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 very much informs the book too. Even though, again, to keep it uh, a, a, a not a not academic book, but a more, more popular book, I really don't delve into that kind of detail because I think that would have been confusing and difficult yeah. for the, the for most people. To, yeah. To get to. Yeah. So let's go back to the beginning. So what what are you you sort of I say mentioned in my review, you begin yeah. the book. Well, uh, let me let me go right. I, I have to get the quote here. I should have this in. Catholics in the United States today are liberal Protestants before we are anything else. To form our moral lives as Catholics is a constant battle to overcome the liberal Protestantism that we began to consume with our mother's milk. And of course, then you go on to explain what you mean by liberal. So maybe you could begin by explaining that and then segue from there, because it'll be a natural segue into what are like the twin foundational principles of, of sort of modern American liberalism? Right. So so and, and this this is important, and I know you know viewers of your podcast are going to understand this in a way that that other people might not, and are going to readily uh, get get what I'm uh, onto. By liberal, I don't mean the word that we use in in, right. in modern American discourse to discuss the left wing of of the political uh, of the of politics in the U.S. So what typically would be a Democrat. Uh, rather, by liberal, I mean every the basic political philosophy that every American holds from the far right of the Republican Party to the far left of the Democratic Party, essentially embracing, you know, with with the exception of, of tiny, tiny margins, maybe on either end, essentially uh, in, uh, encompassing every, everybody in America uh, who has any kind of political awareness at all or who identifies at all with uh, politics. And so what I say is that that, you know, we all speak that language. And 
By liberalism, I characterize it by at least at least two uh, principles. One is a, a, a radical uh, a commitment to radical individualism and the uh, individual as the basic uh, root of of society. Not not that that the human person is not social in his uh, nature, but ra rather is radically individual in his nature. And 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 that and that leads to the privatization of morality. So so everything is private. Everything is individualist, uh, and and the, and and this is characterized by what I call the rise of individual rights language, as as not, as rights language not as claims against the government. I know that's the, the sort of the locky and gloss, and you point this out in your book. The sort of locky and gloss that we like to put on rights language is that it's a claim against the government, but but. It, 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 Regardless of of, how, of of what was intended, and, and I actually don't think that that was intended. I, I I think that the founding is Hobbesian from the beginning. But but yeah. leaving that argument aside, it really doesn't matter because it's Hobbesian now. And so whatever we think about rights now, yes, we th yes, the typical American thinks about rights as rights against the government. But more fundamentally, we think about rights as rights against everybody else. That is individual possessive claims that we have against everyone else, and this is this goes to the heart of the Hobbesian uh, notion of rights, the, the 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 famous war of every man against every man, and of course what Hobbes uh, ad, what Hobbes advocated and Locke admitted uh, in in reading Hobbes, and remember Locke Locke at one point called uh, referred to Hobbes as that strange new doctrine of individual <laughs> rights, but he didn't repudiate it. Uh, nope. I, I don't have that quote handy, but it's uh, in my first book, The American Myth of Religious Freedom. I, I cite Locke's citation of Hobbes's strange new doctrine, which he embraced. And what that means then is that there isn't any principle that, and, and therefore, of course, since every man has a right to everything, there isn't any limiting principle to that. You know, we we hear the, the American libertarians try to say, your right to swing your fist ends when it gets to my nose. Well, there isn't anything in liberal theory that says that that right ends when it gets to your nose. The liberal theory says you can keep on swinging. But the reason we don't is that we have this mutual agreement not to. So and 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 you also hear libertarians say, well, it gives room for all kinds of flourishing of of, of, of voluntary communities and so forth. That very well may the, be the case, but the language itself, and you mentioned this at the outset of the podcast, language matters. The language itself is 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 slowly, and I and I think slowly but acceleratingly, if that's a word, corrosive of the ability to think in terms of community, the more that we, we think in terms of individual claims against one another. And then of course, what that means is that all social structures, all social organizations are purely voluntary. They're pure fictions is the way that I put it. There in are, the as you put it in the book, there's no natural social institutions grounded there are no in- nat they're, all, they're all conventional and they're all, they all exist at the will and the whim of, of the people who make them with no overarching principle that governs uh, that governs them. And, and that individualism, and I think, you know, I think just as an observation, I think it would be difficult for anybody to deny that that's really very much a description, a, an accurate description of where we are in American society. What people might, what people will will uh, dispute, of course, is that they'll say, well, that's if we go back to the founding, the founding principles, then we wouldn't have this. But as I said, you know, more liberalism is not the cure for liberalism. <laughs> that's right. Right. Uh, uh, I have to say, when I was reading the book, uh, I, I made a little note in the margin and said the, the one of the reasons why I, I really loved the book, why I was like doing a little tap dance in my in my study here as I was reading. I pointed it out to my wife. I said, Craycraft understands that America is at its root a Hobbesian, a Hobbesian experiment and not a Lockean experiment. And, and that that is something I've thought for a very, very long time. But you really express it well and actually in very few words and uh and and it just cuts right to the chase and i think that you are exactly correct in the, in that assessment it's the war of all against all and as i pointed out in my review of your book in catholic world report we can we can argue until the cows come home to use a cliche about whether or not the american founding you know whether D.L. Schindler and others are right that the American founding is incompatible with Catholicism, or you can go to others, you know, Riley and others who say, no, it's it's absolutely it's absolutely compatible with Catholicism. We can argue that to our blue in the face, to use another cliche. But what we got 
downstream, regardless of what the we got a Hobbesian nation. That's what we got. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Somebody uh, somebody it was either on Facebook or Twitter uh, commenting on my book said, uh, I wonder what Bob Riley will think of it. And I said, well, I said uh, I, I said, I know what he'll think of it. He won't like it at all. But I said that I said therein lies the problem. And in, in, in many ways, yeah. the book is written as a response to that, to that kind of, you know, to that that approach to it. But again, that's that's an example of what I mean, you know, returning to the founding. Well, and, and let's 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 tease this out a little bit, Larry, because you know, it seems to me that the onus, if we say that America is is different from now, is has wound up in a different place from what its founders intended and from the institutions that the founders established, it seems to me that the onus is on those who would say that it's gone off the rails rather than those who say this is the inevitable result. And the 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 individualism, which expresses itself in America in tribalism. So I mean, so you, because you have you have I individuals who 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 form together in tribes, and uh, and 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 so the individualism t takes that form, and we see that tribalization and that that uh, that kind of fragmentary fragmentation in society. And this, so the question becomes. You know, as as I said again, where wherein wherein does the fault lie? Does it the fault lie in something essential in the beginning, or has it has it somehow gone off the rails? And I and again, I think the onus is on those who would argue that it's gone off the rails. And I haven't seen a convincing argument uh, to to that it has. Um, and and yeah. and, and again, the, the Wilkinson Sumpson's written well, response. And if it went off the rails, it went off the rails rather quickly. Very you early. know, I, I I'm reminded oftentimes of of certain forms of Protestant historiography of the history of the church that posit that, you know, you've got this early, early, early church, which was fine, the proto church, but then, you know, there was this rupture right. and yeah. you got Catholicism instead. But when you actually study church history, you realize, well, if there was a rupture, the, the Catholic rupture with true Christianity is already happening in the new Testament itself. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you and know? it's certainly, Yes, it is. And it certainly is happening by the apostolic fathers who knew the apostles. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it becomes harder and harder to maintain this historiography of it went off the rails uh, when you begin to look at American history and you realize, well, if it went off the rails, it was already off the rails yeah. by, by and, the pre presidency of, of Thomas Jefferson, for crying out oh, loud. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't I don't. Jefferson is my is one of my principal foils in my first book. Uh, because yeah. Jefferson, I mean, I, I there's just no arguing around that Jefferson was hostile to Trinitarian Christianity and especially hostile to the Trinitarian Christianity of Catholicism. Um, I mean, Jefferson Jefferson said that it was his hope that no, that um, that no one born no one born alive at his time would not die a Unitarian, and he and he said that in the in the context of thinking that the American political institutions that he helped to establish would themselves be a cause of every person who's now alive becoming a Unitarian. So, so it, it, his political institutions, uh, and, and I think that's important. Let, let me get back to the, the liberal Protestantism, and, and yeah, I, appreciate sure. your, I appreciate your appreciation of that first sentence, because obviously that the point was to, to grab people's attention, and it does. It did. The other part is the Protestantism, because... The Protestantism is the privatization of religious faith and the voluntary nature of the church. And I think this is crucially important. And this is where it goes to the, the kind of Catholic that I spoke about earlier, who, who is a good Orthodox Catholic, who thinks with the church, who is critical of you know dissenting Catholics, but who still think of the church in some sense as a primary a voluntary organization, and even talks about it in terms of a voluntary organization. Now, if all that means is that you're free to join it or not to join it as an act of, of moral agency, that's fine. But that's not what that's not what Protestantism is. That's not what again going back to Locke. Locke said that the that uh, the true mark, the true characteristical mark of the church is toleration, and he said that the church is one voluntary association among others. What that means is not simply that people join it or not join it by an act of free will, but rather that the church itself is created by the wills of its members. Very, very different thing. And of course, the church created by the wills of its members is just yet another conventional contractual relationship that a group of like-minded people come together. As I like to tell my students, Protestants go to church to the church because of what they already believe. Catholics go to church to find out what they believe. And that's a very different 
understanding of what the church is. And so, and, and so at the end of the day, this liberalism of the 16th, 17th century and the Protestantism that actually predates it, interestingly enough, because we go if we if we date the if if we use 1517 uh, uh, as the 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 birth the birth of, of modern Protestantism with Martin Luther, what I call them in the book are the political and religious words for the same basic individualist moral anthropology. And that's that's what I mean by we Americans are liberal Protestants, even we Catholics. Are, are so affected by that, and and I and I and I want to point out, Larry, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not saying that there's anything nefarious on the part of of, of people who succumb to these these uh, right. these twin descriptions. It's just as I say, it's part of our mother's milk, and and we have to be able to identify it before we can resist it. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear you're just being descriptive there in the beginning. It, yeah. yeah, you know, you're just trying to say, well, this. This is the foundational reality. And, you know, I don't think you're the first person to point this out. I mean, I was at a lecture of the infamous Stanley Hauerwas, where he wants, you know, a riff on a common phrase where he said, there, there's no such thing as Catholics in America. There's just Protestants who pray the rosary, you know, <laughs> in that in that twang of his that I can't really imitate, you know. And I've heard permutations that Protestants who go to mass, Protestants who pray the rosary. So yeah. I, I think that, yeah, you're not being pejorative. You're not being negative. You're you're pointing out something that a lot of thinkers, very serious thinkers have pointed out. And, and it's deeply problematic because it does then it redounds then back to so the center point of your book is this beautiful exposition of Catholic social teaching. But what what does how does Catholic social teaching come to be sort of binding uh, on, on the conscience of a Catholic who wants to be involved politically when they've already kind of imbibed this antecedent mentality that I can just yeah. sort of pick and choose because this is just a bunch of people coming together and coming up with some ideas and I can take them or leave them. There's nothing binding in any of it. Well, you know, that that's the $64 question, Larry. And I think I say, I think I say in the book, and I'm not, I'm not sure if this actually made it in it or not, but I said at one point, I realized that, that my quest might seem a little bit quixotic basically because of, of what, of your question, because it's, you know, I'm, I'm one person writing a book that's not, you know, not, not going to be a, you know, a, a gigantic bestseller, uh, just by the virtue of, of of the kind of book that it is, but nonetheless, I I I hope that it 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 does, and I thank you, Larry, sincerely for the work that you've done to help promote the book, both through this broadcast and the interview and the very nice blurb that you wrote for the book before it was published. But I think that what I what I want to do is at least bring to a Catholic reader's attention, intelligent, thoughtful Catholic reader's attention, that this is a problem that we can start maybe trying to overcome by speaking Catholic to one another. And and I know that it's I know that it's that it's a difficult task, but but I but it's one that I think is worth trying to engage in. Um, and 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 I don't think it isn't one of the things that I think that we need to disabuse ourselves of is the notion that we American Catholics need to make American society better. Now you mentioned Stan Harawas, and Harawas is a good friend of mine. He's very very informative, uh, very formative of my yeah. thinking. And, and that's reflected in the book. I'm sure you met him at Duke, I'm sure, when you were in law school. Well, right? even before we actually he he actually uh, was a an unofficial advisor on my my Ph.D. dissertation, which became my first book, The American Myth yeah. of Religious okay. Freedom. So, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. So and you can see, you know, you can see his influence on my writing here and in other places as well. And and one of the things that Harawa says that I completely agree with is that is that it, we we miss we all we all Christians uh, m make a mistake when we think that our 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 role is to make America better or to improve society, and 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 I, I get a lot of pushback on that because people will say, well, of course we're the salt of the earth, of course we, well, yes and no. Yes, we're the salt of the earth, and therefore our witness should have and will have, if it's consistent, a salutary effect on society. But that is not the final cause of our moral action. The final cause of a moral action is to be good Christian disciples, to be followers of Jesus, not to make society better. And it's a fine distinction, but I think it's an important one. Because if we think of the of making society better as the final cause of Christian life, then we we find ourselves wanting to translate 
no, Christian notions into the regnant social or political or cultural notions which surround us so that we'll be relevant enough to change society or to make it better. And, and, and what happens then when we do that is we, we, we think we're translating Catholic thought into, in this case, liberal thought, when in fact, we're just allowing liberal thought to, to sort of transmogrify our Catholic thought into itself. And so I think that one of the things, to, to go back to your question, one of the things that I, that I hope that, that I can convince people who read the book and people who might, I might talk to about it and my own students at the seminary is that we, it is not our, we, we are not mandated to make society better. We're mandated to make disciples. Jesus said, go into all the nations and make disciples, baptizing them in my name. Uh, he didn't. He didn't, for example, say go into all the nations and stop uh, people from having abortion, or 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 stop people from or, or or reform immigration policy or capital punishment. All of those things I think are extremely important, and they're very important to me, and they're very important in my teaching, and they should be important to any Catholic. But the fact is, we're not called to change society. We're called to be disciples and to make disciples of others through our witness. And I think that's where it, where it has to, to, to start. And I think that the reason I emphasize that, Larry, is because if we take that seriously, then we aren't as worried about trying to communicate in a liberal uh, language, a liberal language, but we can start to try to, uh, to really cap recapture a Catholic language, which again, I sort of frame around these these four uh, pillars of Catholic social doctrine. Yeah, well, I, I really, I couldn't agree more. It's one of the reasons I really love the book. Uh, it speaks to the Catholic worker, Dorothy Day, devotee in, in my oh, yes. soul. Yes. Because, I mean, Dorothy's position was, obviously, she was concerned with the poor. Obviously, she was concerned with social conditions. Obviously, she had certain, uh, you know, views about how society should be configured. But her but first and foremost, she said, well, we we just need to live the Sermon on the Mount. Sure, we need to do the spiritual yeah. and corporal works of mercy. Yeah. We instead of worrying about big, huge issues, let's why don't I feed that poor beggar on the street right outside of me? And that will be then what will change the world. Yeah, absolutely, you know. absolutely, and that that uh, you know, I, I I couldn't agree more. And and you know, I I know that you've you've been uh, working at least in the background on uh, canonization, and and, uh, yeah. and I, I I look forward to that day because I think you're exactly right, and I think her vision is the right vision, and I I and that's that's you know, without naming her, I, that's another thing that I try to capture in the book. Well, yeah, and uh, I, I, we can uh, we still have about a good half an hour. We can uh, chat away here, so that's great because I want to get to. Uh, some of the parts of the book where you kind of insinuate you develop a very broad concept of politics. Well, why don't we talk about it now? I want to come back to, I want to come back now. Okay. I'm going to wait a second. I want, I want to focus on what you just said though, about the final end, not being to change society. I think, and I, and I point this out in the review, one of the problems that I've always had, even though I'm a huge supporter of natural law, moral theological discourse, it's, it's the backbone of, of Catholic moral thinking, if I may say so. Uh, but one of the problems I have is that it's often construed by people who believe that the chief function of our mission as Catholics in society is to make society, but that's our final goal. They then take natural law language and say, we have to, we have to de-theologize it. We've got to turn it into this neutral language that all people like an Esperanto language that everybody can agree with. And I just I, I think that that is a complete dead end. I, I think you probably agree, right? I go, I gosh, I, I agree so completely. I think it's just a non-starter. I, I just don't think that that works. And and I, and for all kinds of reasons, many of which we'd have to unpack, which would take more time than, than we have. But I absolutely I absolutely agree with that. And and this is and, and so so the way that I put it, let me reiterate what you said. Absolutely. I mean, if if we define the the classical definition of natural law is the human participation in divine law. Even even if we aren't natural law theorists or theologians or philosophers, we affirm that as as Christians, God, the the eternal law is the mind of God. Our participation in that and our all knowledge is participatory is what we call natural law. Natural law is the name that we give to the human participation in in eternal law. And but it's interesting to me, and I and I and I I, I make this point with my students. The point that you just made is that is that it's not a universal moral language. However, 
we have to understand that even St. Thomas's development of the natural law is informed by his Christian faith. And, and it's, it's, it's Christological, and you do make that point very nicely in your review, and I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate that you caught that in the book, because I don't talk about it specifically in the book, but I think, but it is certainly an animating principle that's in the background of it. And so we need to return to a Christological understanding of uh, the moral life rooted in natural law, uh, without which we can't do theology. And the way that I like to uh, to illustrate it is, you know, my students and and I, my my Mount Saint Mary Seminary here in Cincinnati is is very similar to other seminaries. It's 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 growing. It's seeing increases in vocations, increasing in in, in enrollment. That's very encouraging. The students are good, faithful uh, to the gospel. They're good men. Um, but what I emphasize to them is that, you know, one of their, two of their their recent heroes, papal heroes, uh, St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI, they were not natural law theologians. Now, of course, of course, they embrace natural law in the way that you and I have, have both done it, but, the, but, but they're not natural law theologians, and, 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 uh, and I'm not either. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate a, a right. strong Thomistic understanding, but even St. I, I even argued that St. Thomas was not a Thomist if, if by natural law, if by that you mean <laughs> yeah. natural law, because, you know, there's one question on, on natural law and there's, you know, a, a half a, or more than a dozen questions on the virtues. So, so I think that's a very important point. And, and again, even, even laying aside the contrast between virtue theory or natural law theory, the Christological aspect that you point out is really what is really what we have to return to i agree and i and i think that's what animated john paul it's what animated benedict as well uh Absolutely. john paul of course more personalism phenomenology all that kind of thing uh yeah so i i agree and but let's you know i i know some viewers and listeners are probably saying okay so let's let's return to the concrete here yeah. let's return to the current american political landscape because ultimately yeah. this book is trying to help contemporary catholics negotiate this and I'll just say it, this mess we're in, yeah. you know, it looks like it's going to be uh, so let's limit let, for the time being. We can talk about broader things, but Trump versus Biden coming up, you know, in my opinion, what we've got are two swamp creatures yeah. and, you know, and, and I would have a hard time voting for either one. I think a lot of Catholics, you know, genuine Catholics who take these things seriously are going to have a hard time voting for either one. Then there's always that, well, you know, you vote for the lesser of two evils, but you have to vote, blah, blah, blah. What? And you mentioned earlier at the very beginning of this, both pro, both, pro, both Democrats and Republicans are liberals. As my friend Rodney Hauser says, we just simply have liberal liberals and conservative and liberals. Conservative, yeah. Yeah. And, and so the Republicans are conservative liberals and Democrats are liberal liberals, but they're all liberals. Yes. So what are we? What are you know, what's the current state of the American political landscape in your point of view? Healthy, unhealthy, a disaster, hopeless. Uh, what do we do about that? Well, I, 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 I won't say hopeless because I that might be a you know, that might be a, that might just lead to despair. But but certainly I think it's in a very bad way. And I think it's in a very bad way and, and not in not in small part by the contribution that again that that uh, that a certain kind of evangelical and catholic contributes to in a way that that is very vexing to me and very frustrating to me uh and 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 that really goes to um you know to the the difficulty of 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 of, of for example one issue vote one issue voting so i think and let me come back to that cuz i, I want to let set yeah. that aside for now I think I think that, but I think it's in very bad a very bad way, and I think it's in a very bad way precisely because of the problem of the fragmentation of moral languages, which leads to the the tribalization that I talked about before. And you you also mentioned something that in the review of my book, which I think is very important, and that is the rise of the uh, administrative state, the regulatory state, because yeah. what happens, of course, is the, the the notion that the that the human person is individual by nature is false. So since it's false, but since it's the view that is embedded in American political culture, that the falsehood has to be has to be answered. 
Well, it's not answered by truthfulness, truthful witness. It's answered by regulatory, the regulatory state, uh, which attempts to to rein in or to channel uh, these the, the these rights. And 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 let's face it, our rights are are dragged around by our passions. I mean, we we as going again going back to McIntyre, basically the strain in all of the fragmentation of moral uh, language in the in, in the United States today or in the West is emotivism. Right. And yeah. that's that's one of the basic points of after virtue is that that it's that it's all it's all it's all variations on a theme of emotivism and 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 not rational at all. So we don't have rational morality and which, of course, means we don't have rational politics. And in the current climate, it's breath, it, it's it's baffling to me. And I wrote a recent piece for the Catholic Herald, for example, the UK Catholic Herald. Uh, it's baffling to me that that we ha- these are the two candidates that we have. And it's even more baffling to me that that d- d- put it plainly, Donald Trump uh, gathers has gathered such uh, not just support from people who should know better, but enthusiastic support from people who should know better. And that that really is disturbing to me as well. And I and I, you know, I, I do say in the book, I, you know, there are times in which the better witness, the better Catholic witness is to exercise our public duty, our, our duty to be public citizens uh, by refraining in, in order to show that there isn't a, a, a good alternative. And I think in this election, that's something that Catholics have to really take a hard look at. Now, I want to emphasize, Larry, at this point that I'm not suggesting that a Catholic can't vote for one of these two candidates in good conscience. I'm not suggesting right. that at all. What I am suggesting, however, is that I don't think that we take seriously uh, how uh, we don't we don't take seriously enough our examination of the two candidates in order to make a decision, but rather we resort to some kind of trope or worse, just just our our partisan commitment, which 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 overrides our religious commitment and, and our religious faith, and and that's from the left and from the right as well. Uh, you know whether whether the candidate is a Biden or or Trump. So I think it's a mess. I don't think it's irredeemable, but I don't I don't think it's going to be redeemed in twenty twenty four. No, I don't think so either. And uh, and in terms of voting too, I mean, as some of my friends say that when they go into the voting booth, they don't vote for president. They just leave it like, but they vote down the ticket. They vote for other people, other local things. Um, I'm not certain that that's all that great. And I'm not all certain that certain that write in candidate you mentioned in the book, I think, you know, write ins are sometimes just a way of not voting at all. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and I know I, I've been approached by uh, the Solidarity Party, which is you know so you know yeah. so small as to really not even make a blip. I, I don't want to disparage that because I think that that they're doing, I think that they're articulating the right things, but at this point, at least, it it it, it is the same. I think uh, that type of vote is the same as as not voting, um, which I which you know which I don't necessarily disparage uh, given a particular uh, situation. Um, but 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 again, I, I do I want to emphasize what you said earlier. I mean, we can't we have to understand that that the the choosing the lesser of two evils is 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 not acceptable in Catholic moral thought. That's if right. we can't come to a conclusion, a good a good faith conclusion, in our own conscience that to cast a vote for a particular candidate is actually a good, not just the lesser of an evil, then we really shouldn't cast that vote because then we're choosing an evil, even if in our mind it's the lesser evil. I know that's getting it thick in the weeds of Catholic well, moral. No, but, but it's true. It's I mean, I often tell people, look, I mean, I don't want to be melodramatic here, but what if our two choices were between Stalin and Hitler? Yeah. And you say, well, which one gives us universal health care? <laughs> I vote for that one. <laughs> well, that would be Stalin, I guess. Mm-hmm. OK, so that that kind of a glaring example makes makes it you know a painfully obvious why a and catholic I do, and, I, do, and no. I don't think i don't i don't think and, and, and you know certainly uh, the our choices are not that stark but on no, the other not. hand but on the other hand it, it, our choices are not are not simple either and the pushback that i often get and i know that i'll get when i when i speak and and already have actually when i've done some public talks and book signings which i and i have one a, a few coming up I always get questions from the audience or pushback from the audience about abortion, that that uh, since abortion is the preeminent uh, preeminent moral uh, problem in America, which I agree with, which the the bishops have said, 
and I agree yeah. with that. It is uh, that that therefore that it's disqualifying of the candidate, and therefore you should choose the candidate who who espouses or you know or pays lip service to pro-life issues, and might even promise to institute policies that are pro-life. Well, yeah, I I think that that a candidate's position on abortion can be disqualifying, but I don't think that it works the other way around. That a candidate's position on abortion is automatically qualifying for my vote. If that candidate otherwise espouses policies or positions that are co co corrosive to the common good, corrosive to other very important principles of Catholic moral theology, and if that candidate is 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 perhaps a borderline psychopath then 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 uh then his position on abortion doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't win the day <laughs> yeah you know and there was a time sad it's sad the democratic party uh yeah. of my youth was a party that really did emphasize solidarity the corporate nature of the body politic yeah. that we're all in this together uh, fighting for groups and so on. And sadly, it has now devolved into simply identity politics, it's transgender. All, this, yeah, you know, and, and, and so that that's it's been sad to see the degeneration of the once proud American left into this caricature of itself in this wicked uh, nonsense. Uh, yeah. And I don't use the word wicked in a moral sense, just wickedly awful. Um, and but then you get the Republicans on the other side, and this goes to your point you were just making. All right. What if they espouse a moral anthropology and a view of the human being that is essentially monistic, radical autonomy? They are therefore pursuing a vision of freedom still as the very concept of freedom that has led us to this ideology of yeah. of choice that's that's okay. it that hits the nail on the head and actually you you've entered into my chapter on the family uh yes. and and i i make that very point on my chapter on the family because the the chapter is basically in two parts the first part is just sort of a theology of the family and then the second part i, I make suggestions for how this theology of the family could translate into, into public policy by by advocating free birth, uh, subsidized health care, and um, and whatever the third one is. Uh, I haven't read the book. I don't. While, I don't remember but, either. Sorry. Yeah, but, but and that's fine. It doesn't matter. But the point is, is that my point is about educating our children. We see we see Catholics either homeschooling or pulling their children out of public schools, putting them in private schools. We see the rise. Uh, of of uh, the uh, a, a, a a bump in the the number of private schools or homeschooling uh, consortiums and things like that. Right. What I suggest in the book th that's all fine unless you're teaching them the same individualism in those schools that they're getting in the schools that you're. Oh, stop them right there! One second. Our parish has a homeschooling cooperative. Our ordinary parish way to. My wife ran it for like a couple of years, and she kept bashing her head against the wall against a lot of these like helicopter parents right who who had a notion that the homeschooling cooperative was about achievement and their sons and daughters getting into yale and harvard and princeton it was about making sure that they were the best of the very best of the very best and so it was this whole american model of success yeah. and capitalism and getting what getting ahead in life and she eventually just walked away from it but not for that reason she walked away to it for other reasons uh but but that vexed her greatly yeah because that's more of the same and and if you do that then you know it's going to take a it's going to take some time but eventually th th that they're going to forget the the language of catholicism or the language of traditional christianity because they're because they're using the language of liberalism they're just using it in a way right now that has a, a, a veneer of, of Catholic moral doctrine. And, you know, that, that gets to a point in the book, I, I actually use as a point of departure on this problem of language, uh, a scene from a couple of novels that, from the Aubrey Matron novels by Patrick O'Brien, these famous, this famous series of 20 novels. And, and I, I won't go into more to, too much detail here because of time, but basically I, I set up a scene, a couple of scenes from that book to suggest how 
we can forget our own moral language as it gets is as it gets absorbed into the moral yes. languages of the culture and and that's really that's part of what's going on here and so if we educate our children in the same language that has led to the things that cause us to object to the public schools or to even some private school education then we're going to wind up in the same place eventually it it, it we have to reorient our language we, we have to reorient with the way we think about the human person about culture, about society, uh, about politics and economics and the whole the whole kettle of fish. Yeah, you see this in the spectacle of um, the evangelical churches in the United States, the sort of very conservative Republican Bible Belt evangelical conservatives are now hemorrhaging young people out the door uh, over the LGBTQ issue, where they think that but then the question would be, well, what version of Christianity had they imbibed uh, uh, as they were raised, being raised in these evangelical churches that would then cause them to say, well, the, our church is wrong about all this LGBTQ stuff? Well, it's, it's clearly because those churches were teaching them a view of freedom exactly. and moral. And likewise, you know, in the Catholic Church, to go back to the abortion issue, and I'll let you speak again, I, I said for years, you know, look out. If we overturn Roe v. Wade, and don't be wrong, you won't find anybody more pro-life in the abortion issue than myself. And I'm very happy we overturned Roe v. Wade, which was a horrible decision. Nevertheless, because of 50 or 60 years of abortion in this country, it became part of the warp and woof of our culture. As soon as Roe v. Wade was struck down, I think a lot of pro-lifers expected, well, now there's just going to be this massive wave of states coming forward to criminalize abortions. And yet even Red state Kansas put it up for a referendum and red state Kansas said thumbs up to abortion. We're not going to Ohio where I live. Yeah. 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 Said, no, we're, we're going to keep abortions. And I think it's because in, in the political campaigns leading up to these referendums, what happens is that uh, the left begins to appeal to this language of choice and freedom and rights and so forth. And everybody just rolls over and says, well, yeah, they got a point. I don't want to be an oppressor after all. Yeah, I think there's I think that is really a good point. And I and I I use precisely the, the problem of the way that we people who are opposed to abortion, the language that we use to articulate that opposition actually undermines our opposition. And, yes. that, and that goes that goes exactly to this problem of, of, of rights language that I talked about earlier, because if yeah. we talk and the privatization of morality. Um, so so t so take, for example, the, the common pro-abortion mantra, my body, my choice. Well, of course, that's something that that anti-abortion Catholics will reject. But in 2020, when uh, when the, the the Pope and the bishops suggested that for the purpose of common good we should uh, be vaccinated against COVID, you might not have, they might not have used the phrase, but the but the theory of resistance was my body, my choice among people who uh, reject yeah. that mantra when it comes to abortion. Both of those are expressions of the same individualist morality and anthropology. So you you hit the nail yeah. on the head when Roe v. Wade and I I thought Roe v. Wade was a terrible decision and and having nothing at all to do with the with with the morality of abortion, but just as a matter of 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 of, of U.S. law. But but I but but let's take that example. Of course, now Roe v. Wade. Uh, was only possible uh, in the way that it was that it was structured because of Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965, and Griswold versus Connecticut is what uh, created this uh, this right to privacy in the Constitution. Couldn't find it there, but it found it in the penumbras, uh, the emanations of this penumbras from from other rights. It found this right yeah. to privacy, and and of course, what what anti-abortion Catholics always said it, it, during the Roe regime was that the right to privacy was not in the Constitution, but they still believe in the right to privacy. They just say that it's not in the Constitution. And, yeah. and, and, and that right to privacy includes privatizing morality. Now, no, no, of course, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, I believe that uh, privacy is a is a is a is a good thing, and that and that uh, and that you know we we have to uh, preserve uh, human dignity and and things like that and, and human moral agency. Uh, but but to to reduce it to the individualist privatized morality. Yes. 
uh, is is the big mistake. And therefore, after Roe v. Wade was uh, was was overturned by the Dobbs decision, we didn't have we p uh, opposed to abortion collectively. We did not have the language to oppose abortion because we have used the language that is used to support abortion. And we yes, had forgotten, we had forgotten a language that helps us to oppose abortion other in terms other than the, 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 the regnant liberal uh, idiot. Yeah. And I, and I agree with your COVID example too, because I heard Catholics say that like, whatever happened to my body, my choice. Now, I, full disclosure, I, I, uh, I despise the COVID vaccine. I think it's a dangerous vaccine. I well, didn't and take see, it. And, but see, and, but, but, and but I, my, let, let, I want to interrupt you just to make a very a, a point here. Yes, there were all, and, and I want to emphasize this strongly. There were all sorts of reasons to resist the COVID vaccine. That's the point I was going to make. That <laughs> I opposed it simply because I don't think you develop a vaccine under a program called Operation Warp Speed. Yeah. I opposed it because I, I I distrusted its efficacy and its safety. But I would never have invoked my body, my choice as the reason. I would have simply said, well, I, I just don't trust this vaccine. Uh, yeah. But the idea that there might be a pandemic that would then impose upon us a moral duty to take mm -hmm. a vaccine that actually is not dangerous and does work and preserves us all, especially if it's a, a disease far more lethal than COVID, then you might say, well, yeah, I do have a moral obligation to get that jab in, in that situation, in those circumstances. So I fully agree with the principle that you're invoking there. Uh, and the only reason I, I bring it up, some of my viewers who know that I don't like the COVID vaccine would say, hey, wait a minute, chap, you don't like the COVID vaccine. But anyway, let's, I want to, in the time we have left, Oh, we still have some time left. Good. Uh, I want to do then get on to then the question of, OK, you got all these Catholic, the pillars of Catholic social teaching. One of that I would like to focus on that you bring up subsidiarity. Because that was near and dear to the heart of Dorothy Day and the Catholic oh. worker movement as well. And it, and it cuts to the chase with regard to, like, for example, her choice not to vote. She did not vote. And what I often say to people, though, is that Dorothy Day's decision not to vote was in fact a form of political action. Yes, it was a form of political participation, uh, and and a lot of people cannot seem to get their mind around this idea. And I think it's because they have a very narrow vision of politics as simply electoral processes or something. So maybe you could talk about what is the broader concept of politics that really Catholic social teaching envisions, and maybe subsidiarity allows for other forms of political activity other than just voting. This is this is my uh, probably my favorite topic uh, in the book, Larry, because in fact, it is my favorite topic here. Here's the catechism says that there is a duty uh, of public life. It doesn't say that there's a duty of political life. And what I like to emphasize, and you caught this per precisely in your review of my book, is that politics <clears throat> is a sub part of the broader cultural public life to which we're called to, to participate in. And so Dorothy Day's refusal to vote was not a refusal to engage in, in, in public life or even in political life, because again, I think you're exactly right. Sometimes not voting is the better political action, but let's set that aside and just talk about the broader public understanding or the broader public life uh, to which we're called to engage. To be sure, to the mandate to engage in public life which is a part of the principle of solidarity, uh, includes, with, with exceptions, uh, but, but it includes a presumption of engaging in political life, which means, uh, among other things, voting. But voting is a narrower part of politics, which is itself is a narrower part of public life. And so if we revive the understanding that public life is not reduced to political life, I think that's an important first step. Now, the the you put it in the context of subsidiarity. And I want to talk about that a minute because I think subsidiarity is the most commonly misunderstood of these yes. four principles of Catholic social doctrine. Because when I hear people describe subsidiarity, what I hear is, you know, act, act and institute Catholic libertarianism. That is not what subsidiarity means. And, and by that, I mean that, that what you typically hear is that subsidiarity, the first thing, the first way that people cast subsidiarity is in terms of the smallness and the proximity of helping institutions. Yes, the smallness and the proximity of helping is health, of helping institutions is important, but the way to start thinking about subsidiarity is the help, not the size. The help, not the size. 
The size follows moral agency. The size doesn't follow liberal, uh, liberal, uh, uh, liberal resistance to large government. And so, and, and it comes from the Latin word subsidium to help, right? So subsidiarity yeah. is about helping. Again, going back to McIntyre, a later book, Dependent Rational Animals, is his meditation on how dependent we humans are, more dependent than any other animal uh, uh, on one another. I mean, the human, the, arguably the human is the only one which after born, if left to itself, will always die and never take care of itself in uh, any circumstance. Yes. Um, and and I think that's sort of, it, it's a biological reality, but it's also a metaphor for how dependent we are upon one another. And so subsidiarity is not about the size of institutions or the proximity. It's about their effectiveness in helping the human person to develop and flourish consistent with moral agency. And so uh, when we think about subsidiarity, the, the principle has to be, is this institution, the institution that is most effective at carrying out the principle of helping hu the human person flourish consistent with that person's moral agency. If it's if it helps but takes away agency, then there's a problem. If it doesn't help uh, but it's close, then that's a problem. And so subsidiarity is not inconsistent even with national or even international helping agencies, if it national or international helping agencies are the ones that are most effective at helping consistent with moral agency. <clears throat> now, again, there's a presumptive default to small and local, to be sure, but that's not the measure of a proper subsidiary institution. The measure is the help that it gives consistent with moral agency. I'm so, uh, yeah, I'm so glad to hear you say this, that, that subsidiarity doesn't mean a society of hippie communes, you know, <laughs> no. passing around free cannabis to each other. Nor, nor does it, nor does it mean uh, laissez-faire libertarian economics. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad you brought up the Acton Institute and so forth that, because it is so frequently cast as a, a subsidiarity is totally consistent with capitalism and and a libertarianism and an emphasis on individual freedoms and so on. And one of the things I really like in hearing your description of this is that I have been a longtime advocate for uh, single payer universal health care in the United States, a la the British health system and the Canadian health system and so on. And I, I, I get a lot of blowback from Catholics that, well, that violates the principle of subsidiarity. And I think that your explanation just now puts it very well. I, I think that a populace of people who don't have to worry about their health care premiums and so forth, I think their moral agency is greatly improved by having, you know, now you might completely disagree with my particular politics on this issue, but I think this is a perfect example of what you're talking about. And, 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 it, and if you're right, then I completely agree. I mean, so there's a there's a certain empirical question there. Yeah, exactly. That I yeah. Agree. And and I and I and I suggest that I was going back to my chapter on the family. I forgot what the three points were in the second part. The first is rethinking abortion language. So, but the other two are free or subsidized birth and paid parental leave. Well, free or subsidized birth and paid parental leave are very much in the wheelhouse of what you just suggested. And and paid uh, free or subsidized birth by no means violates the principle of subsidiarity, even if it's a federal program, even if it's a, a, hum, a, a gigantic program. And of course that would be part of a single payer healthcare plan. And that would probably be the best way to implement it. You know, in large part, we do that anyway through Medicare. And in fact, I suggest in the book that a, a, a regime of free childbirth, we already have the structure there. It's just a matter of broadening the structure that's already there. And and I and I, I you know I, I I think that's exactly right and and I and subsidiarity as I, we won't get into it now but the two two moral terms that are most abused I think are subsidiarity and and, and prudence uh, it's, subsidiarity yeah. gets reduced to, to gets reduced to you know again, libertarianism and prudence gets reduced to to cynicism and 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 I, I tell my students prudence is the skillful application of the other virtues it isn't the skillful avoidance of the other virtues <laughs> very good <laughs> you know and I I love to rush in and say now you know that it, you know there is this presumption I think in subsidiarity for you know small is beautiful yes. local is probably better yep. and so if yep. we could find a way to bring yep. healthcare to the vast majority of Americans 
uh, efficiently and so forth in a better way than we do now without necessarily having a national health care. No, sign me up. I'd be I'd be all in favor of it. Right? And, you know, and as I think the subtitle of my book on the family, I think, is uh, the family where subsidiarity and solidarity meet. I think that's I think that's the and, and so you have both of those. You have the solidarity of the natural family. You have subsidiarity because the family should be the first helping institution, but where the family can't. Uh, because it's beyond its means or because of, of yeah. other factors, economic factors, then then we start looking beyond the family to the to the parish, to the county, to the municipality, to the state yeah. or to the federal government. And, and, and we don't say that there's no solution. There's no federal solution that can't be consistent with subsidiarity because there are lots of federal solutions that are perfectly consistent with subsidiarity. You know, just take as an example, you know, highway infrastructure or, or communications yeah. infrastructure, those things that, that, that's not possible without federal involvement and without, in fact, without being driven by federal policy. Uh, and yet those are perfectly consistent with the principle of subsidiarity. Yeah, it's, we could probably multiply exponentially the uh, the the list of uh, entities in the United States where we could debate whether or not they should be you know on a federal level, state level. Right. I'm thinking, yeah. for example, of like our public schools. I've seen proposals that all schools should be private schools, right? That there right. should be no such thing as a as a, as a public school. Uh, and and then there's various ways of trying to fund that and make sure that gets funded. But, you know, we can I, I'm not certain how feasible such things are, but it, it just points. I've seen some arguments saying even our road system should be privatized. You know, the radical what are they called? Anarcho capitalists, I think they're called. Capitalists, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, there was an experiment that just in the past decade or two in Texas of a private highway and nobody used it and it went bankrupt. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that you know, be a parallel. It was a parallel to I thirty five, the north south uh, uh, freeway, but nobody used it because the the free the free highway uh, was slower, but it it didn't cost ten dollars or whatever to use. There you go. And we already have now have this. Uh, I don't know if it's increasing or decreasing privatized prisons. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that have been problematic. I think. Well, I think I think that's right. And, and what happens is and this is happening in other areas as well, not just not just in prisons, but in other areas where uh, where hedge funds have have purchased things as as profit centers rather than as centers that are supposed to maintain some mission or something like that. Yeah. And, I, and I think that the, the rise to, you know, 30 years ago, Larry, I was close to a libertarian Catholic, my, uh, libertarian myself. I tell my students that I was libertarian for about five minutes, and, and that's all it took for me to realize this is not the way. Uh, but, but um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm becoming, having a more and more chastened view of capitalism is the way that, that hedge funds and private equity can come into a, a whole industries and Hang change them from service industries to profit centers. And by doing that, uh, they they uh, lose focus of what they're supposed to be doing, and and I think private prisons is another example of of that. And I think you know if we if we privatize all education, it won't be long before it becomes uh, it becomes yet another profit center of a hedge fund or or a, a private equity fund. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm having an issue here. Suddenly, are you still there? Okay, yeah, there we yeah. go. I, I got strangely. I, I, I'm sorry. I look distracted. I got a phone call on my on my phone. For some reason, it interrupted this on my end, uh, and I, yeah. I can't figure out somehow the whole. Maybe it's got something to do with the Bluetooth of my earphones or whatever. I'm, I'm going. What in the heck is going on here? So at any rate, uh, I, I kind of missed everything that you just said in the past thirty seconds. But I'm sure it was it was brilliant, and I'm glad my my viewers got to hear it. But uh, we are we're sort of running out of time here. Yeah, I, I, I do have to go. Um, I have another commitment, but uh, maybe there's so much packed into this book. I do want to I don't want to just end with the sort of the the pro the problems with libertarianism. And I don't want to leave the impression since I'm like a big advocate of national health care that uh, that I'm not aware of. And I know you're aware of the the problems associated with the Hobbesian Leviathan. Right. Yeah. And right. the increase of the power of the centralized state right. is also something we have. To, and this is why my wife is always arguing with me. She's totally opposed to national health care because she believes that we don't, don't we do not want to invest the modern surveillance state 
with this kind of increasing power. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. Well, and, and I and again, one of the things that I suggest, and I and I do this, and in fact, I went we with my editor, we went back and forth a little bit uh, on this when I was writing the book, is that I would is that I I I is, she was basically what she said, not in so many words, is is that you you're 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 making too many caveats or too many hedges. In, in other words, uh, toward the end of the chapters, the pol the policy chapters, the chapters on family work, economics, and. Uh, and and uh, politics, uh, I, I I suggest that by no means and what I no, by no means am I suggesting that this is the only way or that this is the only prudent way that is consistent with Catholic moral doctrine and with the four pillars of Catholic social doctrine. It, it certainly is the case that people of goodwill with even within that paradigm right, exactly. can disagree on what and on what's going to be the better option. And I I, I say this even on my chapter the the chapter where I have the most most concrete policy proposals is on the family with with free or subsidized child care and paid parental leave. But even there, I say the way that that might be uh, in, in, uh, instituted could 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 you know be subject to a broad range of 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 good faith debate. But let's put the broad range of good faith debate in the context of solidarity and subsidiarity and dignity and the common good, and not in terms of of uh, of uh, individual possessive rights, and certainly not in terms of of uh, economic or fiscal policy. Fiscal policy should follow the proper moral policy. The moral policy shouldn't follow the fiscal policy. And we can make we can have debates about what the best approach is or what the better approach is within the context of reorienting our language. And that's fine. And I don't gainsay that. Yeah, yeah. But what I suggest is that let's at least try to recover the proper language and therefore the proper paradigm in which to have these debates. And, and that's where I really hope the book is. And, and I appreciate you bringing it back to that because the book is the book is not, as you point out in your in your review of the book, the book is not a, a negative. The first chapter is sort of a deconstruction, but the rest of the book yeah, is it's a positive proposal. Positive proposals of how to 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 start thinking like Catholics again and articulating and speaking Catholic to one another so that we can speak Catholic to the broader public. That is a great way to wrap this up. Hey, would you be open to a part two by any yes. chance? A part, yeah, I think <laughs> we, I think th there's so much. I, I took all these notes and I'm only like halfway through them. So if yeah, you're I'd open love to do that. Yeah. OK, so because uh, uh, as I said to you off off camera before, I, uh, unfortunately, I, I have a hard break here. I have to do today that was a little unexpected. Uh, so That's I don't want to give you short trip because this is a really important conversation that we're having, especially in this election year. And so uh, and plus, I want you to sell books. So th there you go. That too. So we thanks, go Ken. For, 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 we'll, we'll do a part two. So hang on, folks. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for listening. And thanks, Ken, for for being here today. Thank you, Larry. And thanks for your support of the book. I really do appreciate it. You're welcome.